Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to the German Marshall Fund and to this event today uh, towards a new brain drain paradigm in the Western Balkans. My name is Jörg Pombrig, I'm Director of Central and Eastern Europe at the German Marshall Fund, and I have the pleasure of hosting this event and sharing it uh, today. Now, the topic of our uh, session today is the dramatic departure of especially young people from the Western Balkans. And now to illustrate this drama, let me just mention that in the last 30 years alone, Serbia and North Macedonia have lost about 10% uh, of their population to brain drain and immigration. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina about 25% and Albania even up to 40%. Uh, these are obviously very dramatic uh, figures. Uh, this is a trend that has very deep uh, uh, effects for uh, the Western Balkan societies, their politics, their demographics, of course, and their social makeup, and not least also their, uh, their economies. And what's worse even, uh, it seems that uh, many of the efforts that have been tried over the last decades to stem this trend, uh, to, to seize it, to control it perhaps, uh, they seem to have failed. Uh, so none of the strategies, the approaches, the policies that have been put in place either by governments in the Western Balkans or also with the help of the international community uh, seem to have borne any, uh, any fruit. So it seems high time uh, to rethink this entire issue, the approaches to it, uh, and really to, uh, to force a paradigm shift in the discussion and in the handling uh, of this massive brain drain from the Western Balkans uh, region. Now, to discuss this today, uh, we have uh, an excellent expert uh, who has just published a fresh policy paper uh, on this issue, Marian Ichowski uh, from North Macedonia. Uh, he's been a Rethink CE Fellow with the German Marshall Fund over the last, uh, over the last year. Uh, and within this fellowship, he's conducted research and produced a very substantial policy paper on this, uh, on this issue that we will discuss today. Marianne is a program manager at the Organization for Social uh, Innovation, Arno, in uh, North Macedonia. He's a specialist in research and programming on youth and human rights education with a special focus, of course, on the uh, Western Balkans. He holds a law degree from St. Cyril and Methodius University in Skopje, Macedonia, uh, and uh, a, a degree, an MA in human rights and democracy from the University of uh, Bologna. Uh, Marian, welcome and congratulations already on the research that you have done and the policy paper uh, that we will hear more about uh, in a minute and which we will discuss. I will also share the link to the policy paper in a couple of minutes. Now to discuss Marian's research, we have another uh, expert uh, to comment and to discuss this issue with us. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Anna Krasteva. Uh, she's a seasoned expert in migration and refugee policies and politics, as well as citizenship and civic education. She directs the Center for Refugee, Migration and Ethnic Studies at the Department of Political Sciences at the New Bulgarian University. She's also the team leader of the EU project Migration for Work. And as a reflection of her many scholarly achievements, Anna holds an honorary doctorate of uh, the University of Lille in France. Anna, it's a pleasure to have you on this, uh, on this discussion. Now, before we start, uh, a few technical matters that I wanted to flag to you all. First, the session is recorded uh, and will be made available on the GMF YouTube channel after the session. Uh, second, uh, in terms of the agenda, we will hear from Marian first on uh, his research and his findings. And we will then hear comments from Anna before we open uh, for discussion. Uh, for the discussion, I would ask you all to uh, put your questions in the chat function that is open and functional for this, uh, for this call. And I will then pose these questions to uh, our two speakers. Now, with this, let me end my brief introduction, hand it over to Marianne, because uh, I myself and certainly all of you are very curious to hear about his research and his findings. Marianne, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jörg. And I'm really glad to have this opportunity to present the paper that I've been working on in the past months. And I want to say 
a big thank you to the German Marshall Fund for first of all allowing me to do this fellowship and second of all to the team of the German Marshall Fund about the help and the guidance throughout the process of writing and uh, publishing uh, this paper. Let me allow first before I start the screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Just confirm me. Okay, so um, thank you, um, thank you very much. Uh, you're proving to Russian, and indeed, the youth brain drain is a topic in the Western Balkan countries. It's and it's not topic which is recent because uh, the, um, uh, the the region has a rich history of modern uh, immigration. Uh, we must say because only after the uh, Second World War there are three significant waves which contributed to loss of the uh, population. And as you uh, rightly mentioned, since the 1990s there is a nine percent drop of the population in Serbia, a ten percent population drop uh, in uh, uh, North Macedonia, twenty four percent in Bosnia and Herzegovina, thirty seven percent in Albania and 24 in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, this means that the population of the Western Balkan six nations are um, rapidly shrinking and only after 1990s uh, uh, the Western Balkan has 4.6 million um, uh, diaspora members which is 30 to 45 percent share uh, of the resident population. And, uh, and somehow expected the young, educated and skilled people are the forefront of the immigration of the Western uh, Balkan, uh, Balkan seats because they are leading the way and as we say, they vote with their feet. So besides the intensity of the youth brain drain which is happening in the region and other specifics for uh, the region itself, it's about the potential uh, because Recent research uh, rank uh, uh, the Western Balkan six as one of the world leaders in brain drain, meaning that it's far behind from the competition with the other developed countries to attract its own talent and to keep its own talent uh, uh, home. Um, there is 33% of the young people who expressed a very strong or really strong desire to, uh, to leave the region. And it's estimated that nearly 1 million young people will leave, leave the Western Balkan region over the next decade. Uh, this confirms only the findings of uh, 2017 of Gallup, which says that in the uh, forthcoming decades, the Western Balkan six will lose uh, between 27 and 50 percent of its young and educated citizens, with overall population loss of 15 percent. Um, something, of course, that is uh, causing really a detrimental uh, consequences for uh, the Western Balkan societies and the Western Balkan uh, countries. First of all, in loss of the human capital, because. Uh, as we know, if you lose the youngest and brightest, uh, uh, as we say, then the economic and democratic prosperity of the, the region uh, is on the question mark. But on the other side, there is also economic losses um, uh, for, for this phenomenon, which uh, actually grant in billions of euros. For example, uh, the loss in GDP is 3 billion in, the, uh, in all of the countries. Loss in investment in education is uh, around uh, 840 million to 2.46 billion euros, um, which uh, actually in, in Sarsor are the money which are uh, invested in the youth talent, but not capitalized in the countries itself. Uh, this also creates a lot of more problems, for example, as lack of access of availability uh, and um, uh, of basic services, services in the first row, kill care, engineering, but also maintenance, repair, and something which is uh, less skilled. And of course, uh, it's a problem because when you uh, lose the critical mass who needs to lead this uh, democratic and, and economic prospect, there is uh, really uh, fertile ground for populism and anti-emigrant sentiments, which is backed with uh, dropping EU citizen support and anti-EU sentiments. And uh, this is uh, seen in the latest period also in Europe, but also in the Western Balkans, where uh, the European Union is uh, probably the main culprit of shrinking of the Western Balkan uh, six populations. So um, another thing which is characteristics for the, for characteristic for the region, for me really interesting is about the relations with the European Union, because this is an area which has strong connections due to the EU accession processes, which all of the countries are, uh, are in the processes and they want to be, uh, they are potential EU member states. 
Uh, also, the region is interesting for the European Union because it has really uh, good uh, geostrategic and trade importance, and it has high interdependency uh, in the last years. So that's why in the paper, when I suggest the policy reforms on the policy alternatives, I also focus not on, uh, on the Western Balkan countries itself, but also on a broader picture of how the youth brain drain can be mitigated through the EU accession process and with the help of the European uh, Union. So uh, the factors for um, this, uh, for factors for this massive brain drain I somehow anticipated. And in the first row, of course, that the young people uh, leave the region because they are really in disadvantaged position. Uh, there is really high youth unemployment. There is exclusion in the society. There is poverty, but also uh, they uh, lack uh, a bit of time and hope, let's say, because uh, the region is one of the poorest in Europe with low democratic and economic progress. What is really interesting in the last five to 10 years maybe is that uh, these push factors are slowly shifting uh, because there is diminishing discrepancy between the economic and non-economic factors, meaning that uh, if young people uh, 15 years ago, they wanted to leave region for better salaries and better jobs, Today, they leave the region because they're not satisfied with their education, the public services, the good governance, the healthcare, the pollution, and so on and so forth. So this is a small shift in the tendencies of the uh, youth brain drain and youth immigration that the current policies do not take into account. On the other hand, we are all aware that uh, modern migration and brain drain uh, is dictated by the most developed countries. So as a pull factor, as an attractive factor, why people move to the European Union first and foremost is the liberal EU migration policies, which are backed up in this uh, period with visa liberalization, but also really important liberalization of the labor markets of some of the member states. Uh, the first example here is Germany, who liberalized the market uh, for the Western Balkan citizens and accepting easy employment of some of uh, some of professions like healthcare, ICT, engineering, but also there are a lot of uh, other bilateral agreements with other EU member states for easy employment of these qualified professionals. And this is not something new because through history it happened this uh, to have this kind of agreements between the European Union countries and uh, Yugoslavia back then. But the interesting thing is this this agreement does not have those return clauses when after a certain period of time, the Western Balkan citizens need to go uh, back home. Um, uh, so um, when considering all of this, someone may, may say that the Western Balkan governments are doing a lot to resolve the issues because it's not an understatement to say that the whole future of the region depends on it. But the reality is that they do too little to keep youth home. And there are a lot of factors about this. I will try to, to summarize the, the main ones. This first because the youth brain drain is really sensitive topic, uh, which is rooted in the tradition and collective memory and prone to politicization and misuse. Uh, for example, uh, during the elections in prior elections, youth are the main topic in all of the countries, but not as a productive a policy area, but also as an um, uh, area of uh, the where where parties blame and shame each other and uh, for the contribution to the talent talent exodus. So this creates a, a negative images and negative um, uh, negative narrative in the media, in the political parties, in the society, which generally has some spillover effects on policy. Until now, uh, in general, uh, we can say that uh, the youth brain drain is a neglected and oversimplified area and is not recognized as a separate policy area. Until now, um, there are several approaches how the uh, Western Balkan six countries try to mitigate the issue. And the first one is, uh, let's say, the more conventional one when they try to retain or to keep youth home through employment and through education policies. So there is a lot of proliferation of, of policies for employment, which are labeled as uh, revolutionary brain drain measures. For example, small subsidies for young people, small grants for uh, starting their own companies, uh, but also introducing a dual education system and uh, the Western Balkan uh, and the European um, uh, Youth Guarantee, which is implemented in North Macedonia. Uh, on the other hand, after 2010, which is quite late considering that there's, there's been more than 20 years of the independence of the countries, uh, the, uh, the government's focus on return and resource policy, meaning to attract uh, young people back home through their general diaspora engagement policies. And these policies are focused more on the remittances, 
to turn them to investment. So this remittance sense to investment to green is the main one who is led by now. Um, after 2010, in this diaspora engagement, it's really interesting to see that there is a really hyper production of key legislation and strategic documents. So if you open the strategic documents in every country, you can find uh, laws on diaspora, strategies on diaspora. Uh, you can find strategies from brain drain, resolutions for migration policies, which are offering quite comprehensive framework. For example, uh, they uh, they create um, uh, modern bodies and modern governance, modern structure. Uh, they, they create ministries, committees for cooperation, diaspora centers. Uh, they also create some investment uh, mechanisms such as diaspora banks, diaspora funds, diaspora, uh, diaspora unions, yet without any specific youth aspects. But what can we say about uh, all of this together and how the Western Balkan countries are trying to keep youth home is that uh, they have limited impact because after uh, these 30 years of independence, the youth unemployment is still high. It's more than 30% in all of the countries. The, the education system, according to the last PISA, PISA test, are one of the worst in Europe. The massive drain, brain, brain drain is still there. There is no circulations, and the main point of turning and uh, remittances to investments is only three to eight percent. So uh, the key reasons for this are many, uh, but we can start slowly by saying that uh, first and foremost the countries lack data on the migrations and brain drain. And why is that? First of all, is uh, because they rely on the censuses, which uh, currently they are more than 10 years old, but also they lack some qualitative research that will um, try to identify who is out there in the diaspora. So how many young people, what they do, what are the skills, what are the profession, and most importantly, how they can fit in the plans for economic and social improvement of the countries. Um, second reason is they depend on the political landscape. So usually the problems that are happening in the Western Balkan six that are exported in the diaspora. So we can see um, a very hot and cold connections with the, with the diaspora when something starts and then um, then it, it stalls and it's, uh, for example, uh, one country can form a ministry, then after a while the ministry uh, is scrapped. We, we see a lot of shifting beside, in, between institution, a lot of, lot of new mechanisms on and on without basically assessing what is done by now. And we can say that all the institutions who are in charge of implementing this policy, starting from the ministries, agency, uh, diaspora uh, members, Members, they lack um, they 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 lack capacities and they have uh, they have um, uh, weak coordination. Even some of them, for example, in North Macedonia and Albania, this diaspora policy does not have matching funds. So basically, they are just put on the paper to satisfy what the policy framework requires from uh, the policy makers. Um, but, and there is a lot of good example with the civil society sector, especially with the help of the international community, as York mentioned at the beginning, which are quite successful, but for a short period of time, because after the end of the funding, they are not continued by the Western Balkan six government, which is a big, uh, big negative consequences of this policy making. And um, last but not least, the brain drain efforts or the fight against brain drain is closed within national borders. So every country until now um, had its own mechanisms to fight brain drain and they're uh, basically based between national borders. After 2008, with the help of the European Union and under European Union auspices, uh, the Regional Cooperation Council was formed to Western Balkans weren't in the regional youth cooperation uh, office, which somehow structured the communication between the countries. But if we analyze the programmatic part of uh, all of these institutions, we can see that they do not have a common vision about youth brain drain. Uh, but on the contrary, they have specific portfolios where they address the same problems like youth employment, mobility, which are uh, which are not. Uh, which are not functioning in the national scenarios as well. Uh, the most important maybe initiative here is the regional economic area, and I will go through on in, the, in the next uh, chapter of it, uh, because the regional economic area tries to do from the Western Balkans a uh, small European Union, let's say, because it tends to mimic the 
um, the four freedoms of the European single market. So enhanced regional cooperation and enhanced trade, enhanced investments in order to start moving the region a bit and preparing to enter to the European Union. Uh, but here we can see that uh, these problems of political constellations, spillover effects of bilateral disputes, not enough elite buy-in, but also the institutions do not have the capacity to properly implement the, re the regional economic uh, area. And with that, to facilitate a good grounds for mobility of students, for mobility of professionals, for employment between the region, uh, which is basically still on, uh, on, on low level. Uh, so um, have in mind all that this, this paper wants to, uh, uh, to suggest a shift of the paradigm. And the shift of the paradigm is basically uh, relying on two, uh, two elementary premises. One is that the Western Balkans countries need to stop fighting this question alone and they need to consider a regional aspect. Why? Because first of all, they all have the shared same problem, which is huge brain drain. They all have shared, uh, they all have uh, similar solutions and none of them is successful in mitigating the, the question. On the other hand, um, they, uh, the second premise is that um, the Western Balkan governments should not try to keep young people home. Uh, because with this space intensity of youth brain drain as the potential of the brain drain, as we saw in the, in the next 20, 30 years, the potential for economic and democratic progress will not be in the region, but will be in the young diaspora outside uh, the region. So to do all of this and to rely on these two basic premises, first of all, uh, the key precondition is changing the narrative. Because as I mentioned, there is always a notion of the brain drain as a negative phenomenon. Uh, it creates a lot of problems for them over the countries. And this is true, but the Western Balkan governments never ever accepted this, this problem can be a potential and viable solution. So for this to happen, first of all, uh, the, the, uh, the youth brain drain needs to be fully recognized on political and policy level as part of the difficult questions. And while having the interviews for this paper with the policy makers, uh, they all say that youth brain drain is really complex uh, topic that the countries are afraid to bring another difficult topic to the table besides the, the one they have, bilateral dispute, uh, regional cooperation, reconciliation, and other topics which are handling for the last 20, 30 years. So for the youth brain drain to be properly addressed, it needs to enter as part of the difficult question and to be part of this EU accession process, part of everything that is happening on policy and political, uh, on policy and political level. And and this is really, really important uh, because uh, there, there is a really good example of this. And this is Ireland, which back in the 90s had similar problems in the Western Balkans and basically had the same case. A lot of emotions, a big diaspora um, outside, a lot of questions how to engage the diaspora back. But it happened that through a horizontal cooperation with the civil societies, international organization and the media, they turned water into a wine and they started to engage the diaspora and return young people and return the businesses back home. Um, the new youth brain drain paradigm with this paper suggests is basically based on, uh, on three key areas. And those three key areas are regional diaspora engagement, new EU Western Balkan Six migration deal and enhanced regional cooperation. I have to stress that in the moments of writing the, uh, the paper, I was really inspired to suggest this because it was the proper momentum. Paradoxically, COVID-19 can play a good role uh, here for the Western Balkans because the experience of the previous economic crisis is this one we face now, is that in highly immigration countries such as Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, in midst of the economic crisis, there is uh, there is a, a, a big amount of return in circulation. So this is the momentum to, 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 to meet young people back home or uh, in other way to convince them to come back home. And the second thing is the current Western Balkans EU policy and political relations, which all of them endorse regional cooperation. We all know that the Western Balkans countries tend to enter the uh, European Union, but the less signals with the new methodology, uh, with everything that is happening in the European Union, the internal problems, we can see that the European Union is this more, insists more on 
having a strong region as a reliable partner to enter in the EU in the next uh, years. So um, before saying this, um, we, we, I said that uh, the Western Balkans seeks to rely on the remittances to investments, which uh, its approach, which, uh, which proved to be non-successful until now. So they start, need to start thinking beyond remittances, uh, uh, beyond remittances. So it's not all about the finances of the diaspora, because nowadays we have a lot of young people who have knowledge, skills and networks who can bring them to a country or one way into another to, uh, to invest in their home countries. So this has to be done in cooperation with the EU, as I mentioned, to map the potential of the young diaspora, to identify them and to offer them some kind of engagement into the uh, countries. Example of Ireland, Estonia, the city of Plovdiv say that if you revive the financial mechanisms, if you uh, in, invite them, if you use, uh, if you invite them, if you attract them with fiscal policies, if you attract them with good promotion and conditions that they are ready to come back home, to transfer the businesses, to transfer the knowledge. And we live in a really beautiful moment for this about transferring knowledge from your couch in your living room. So uh, the, ICT, uh, the ICT tools and the modern technology uh, can also grant transferring of knowledge remotely, digitally, which is more easier because you don't need to convince someone to return or circulate. You just need to engagement with the proper uh, let's say, offering the proper vision that you have for development of the country. So virtual return circulation, tick nets, research networks can be a viable option to explore here. Um, the second is the new Western Balkan 6U migration deal, which for me was really interesting because in the literature, European Union is labeled as the disowned broker of the Western Balkan 6 demography. Why? Uh, first of all, because a lot of young people go to the EU to live, but second of all, because there is a glow, growing leverage and accountability of the European Union without admitting the problem. So um, uh, basically, a European Union countries do not uh, uh, display the benefits that they have from the migration, they don't display the, uh, the negative effects the Western Balkan six have with this massive uh, youth brain drain. And why this is important, it's not about blaming the EU, this is very common uh, in migration movements everywhere in the world, it's because the European Union has the interest for joint management of the problem. Um, because the European accession on one hand and the brain drain are mutually exclusive. In the 20, 30 years of now, if you don't have this critical mass, who will uh, push for democratic and economic reforms, then you won't have uh, Western Balkan six country ready to enter in the European family. And from the last years, there are a couple of policy documents were really, really important, which is the economic and investment plan and the Western Balkan again, agenda on innovation, research, education, culture, youth and sports, which uh, a bit shy introduced the problem and put them in the framework. So they say we uh, adopted these documents because we think it will provide more circulation and will uh, at some point stop the brain drain. So this is a really, uh, a really, let's say, good common grounds to build upon because uh, these uh, new policies are uh, uh, in the way of the making. So they are programmed, but of course they can depend on uh, how the Western Balkan governments uh, will require, how the inputs will be, how the discussion between the European Union and the countries itself would look like. So it is a really, really good opportunity to put the brain drain inside the document as a cross-cutting uh, team and to introduce return in circulation scheme and partnerships. For example, co-employment, um, mobility of uh, people from the Western Balkans to the EU, uh, the, to open outsourcing businesses from the European Union to, and to the region. And of course, with return clauses on something that they will make or attract young people to go back home. And uh, this is needed, the circulation and exchange of knowledge and experience, because we can see that the, the administration, the universities, uh, also the municipalities in the Western Balkan six are not capable to attract and utilize the EU investments and funds. So with this circulation and knowledge, I think that we can build a good ground for equipping them to use the, the funds, to promote the funds, and also to help to attract and to uh, retain the youth capital back home. Uh, so the last thing is about enhanced regional cooperation, which is the third thing in this uh, brain drain paradigm relies on. And 
First and foremost, uh, the paper relies on the common regional market. As I mentioned, that uh, the regional economic area is the start uh, of uh, of uh, trade and mimicking the, uh, the the single market from the European Union. The common regional market is an advancement. So the political and policy priority to rethink the Western Balkan six should uh, be the common regional market and to put youth brain uh, drain. Why? Because through a common regional market, the research showed that uh, a common regional market has 18 million uh, of uh, consumers and it has 6.7% uh, more potential for a GDP growth. But on the other hand, if um, the, 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 the region allows for young people to circulate, to recognize qualifications, to get employment in the other countries, then you have this circular migration, which will uh, make the region more attractive for the people inside the region, but also for the people outside the region who will uh, who will like to move there. Take, for example, Estonia. It's a really small country, but it's called the European Little Technological Giant, which basically managed through introduction of digital nomads, visa, ease residency, e-businesses, and all other sorts of benefits uh, for, uh, for for businesses to attract a lot of people from uh, from Asia and from Europe to move their businesses there. Uh, and uh, the last two things from this European uh, enhanced regional cooperation is the guarantee facility that uh, these instruments offer. So European Union will back the investments, will guarantee the safety of investments of uh, of the of uh, the investors, which can be put in relation with the diaspora investments. And why the diaspora investments here are important is because besides the finances the diaspora brings especially the young diaspora, they bring their networks knowledge, but also they, they bring their affection to develop the region. And there is a data from uh, some of the Western Balkan countries, for example, in Kosovo, diaspora returnees are more likely to fund the business. 98% of the patents in uh, Albania are filled by uh, returnees, 67% in Serbia. So the innovation and uh, uh, the innovation and, and the entrepreneurial spirit is done through diaspora channels. And last but not least about having all of this successful is uh, endorsement of the EU policies and regional bodies that, bodies that are already existing. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have the Regional Cooperation Council, the Regional Youth Cooperation uh, Office and the Western Balkan funds who are not working as one. So in these documents, everybody needs to find its own place uh, to be united and to be synchronized on how to uh, to act. For example, uh, forming a joint commission, forming a joint body, where everything will start on of drafting the policy and, 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 uh, and proposing the policy uh, can be one idea. And of course, increasing their capacities in terms of uh, technical, human and financial capacities to be able to uh, run these programs. So. This was in a bit, I'm not sure my paper, and sorry for taking a few minutes more. Not to, not to worry, Maya, and thank you very much for this very comprehensive and at the same time, I think very, very well structured and clear uh, uh, presentation. I think you gave us uh, an awful lot of food for thought. Um, but before we go into a broader discussion uh, amongst all of us of your uh, of your paper and this this presentation, let me turn it over to Anna for her uh, immediate uh, feedback on this. Uh, and Anna, of course, I guess uh, you will couch this also in your uh, sort of long-standing research and broader findings that uh, uh, that you have. So perhaps there is a look here or there also beyond the Western Balkans, uh, because I think uh, we all agree that these are these are issues not just facing this region but uh, but many others including in Europe as well. Anna over to you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Allow me in this, uh, this uh, September 1st uh, so that between holidays and uh, academic year to start uh, with uh, a poetic touch. I started the day flying in a balloon at sunrise admiring one of the most amazing most beautiful landscape. Why do I start uh, with this image? Because it is a nice metaphor of the youth migration and mobility. If I simplify a little bit, I could say all migrations are restricted, limited, unwanted in a way. There is just one 
which is encouraged, stimulated, wanted, and this is the youth migration. So it is a very special type for migration reasons and also for um, actors reasons. All societies construct a major or a main social and political figure to transfer the main message of this society at a specific period. Revolutions adore the youth. Everything should start from the beginning. Transitions are softer <laughs> revolutions, but they also adore youth because they want to start and they want to start from the beginning. So the combination of the two, so youth as a major figure for the societies in transition and the migration of highly qualified and youth makes it really top migration, number one migration. Very uh, rich, very ambitious, and uh, a really uh, excellent study of Marian. I would like to congratulate uh, him for that. I would structure my uh, short comments uh, in a few perspectives. Always uh, looking for some uh, contradictions, paradoxes. Uh, um, I think uh, these are the best analytical figures to understand such a complex, ambiguous phenomenon as migration. So uh, state versus actors, the first one, pol politics and policies from one side versus activism from another side, exit versus uh, a voice, a very famous uh, a distinction, recon uh, reconstruction and the reconciliation uh, through, uh, through migration. Brain drain. Let's think a little bit of the concept. It not only connotates in a negative way, but we'll come to that later, let's say a specific time of migration. It introduces and imposes the state perspective on the very concept, brain drain, is the way the state suffers or pretends to suffer, but let's think that states are sincere. I have doubts, I will <laughs> introduce a few elements for my doubts in a second. They impose their own perspective. I am a political scientist, I am very much concerned and I do analyze policies, politics, the state perspective, but I do analyze the citizen's perspective. From a citizen perspective, youth migration is conceptualized or could be conceptualized completely different. Freedom for Albania and Eastern Balkans where migration was forbidden for decades, but also flight, if I take my metaphor of uh, flight, to a more meritocratic environment and flight to a more democratic environment. So brain drain is a very ambiguous concept. Um, so, but there are a cluster of concepts. So let's uh, introduce a few of them. I'll not uh, lecture. <laughs> so, uh, professor, I tend to lecture, but uh, okay, just to make the complex uh, uh, phenomenon a little bit more complex. So when skilled migrants, young migrants go, let's say, to another environment, there are two opposite, uh, uh, let's say, direction of, uh, uh, let's say, their stories there. One is brain loss if they could not find, uh, let's say, a job at the level of their qualification, which also could be conceptualized as brain waste because the migrant loses, the host country loses, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the destination, uh, the host, not the, uh, the origin country also loses. But it could be brain gay. Uh, uh, etc. So we see what uh, also Marian uh, mentioned several times, a lot of emotions, not only on the policies, but even in the definition of concepts. 
So a very academic way to avoid them uh, is uh, uh, to um, uh, use a more analytical term uh, uh, with, without connotations, which is a brain, uh, a brain migration. Uh, so no connotations and uh, no the state perspective uh, uh, because uh, uh, there is no need to prioritize uh, the state perspective of uh, the citizens one. I come, let's say, to this uh, second uh, yeah, di dilemma in a way, uh, policies uh, versus activism. So just one or two words uh, uh, on the EU policy so that uh, Marian mentioned uh, several of them, very relevant ones. In my more panoramic, uh, let's say, comment, um, I would say Marian's paper is so interesting today because it happens in a crucial turn in EU policies. If for decades and even today, they have been determined by securitization, now they are shifting this major, which is both policy and ideological, let's say, perspective to talent policy. So from securitarian migration, policy to talent policy. There are plenty of new concept, policy concepts so that uh, uh, talent partnership, uh, talent pools, new package on skilled migration, etc., etc. So it is in a way a pleasure, which has never been the case before, of reading <laughs> the EU policy documents because the whole discourse, let's say, has changed and so that it is really a very very positive and favorable uh, soil, uh, uh, let's say, for studies uh, uh, like uh, 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 Marian's uh, uh, one. More difficult, let's say, to summarize Balkan policies. They are always much more ambiguous. I'll start uh, with a very provocative uh, quotation of one Romanian, uh, uh, not Western Balkans, but still Balkan uh, uh, president, uh, who years ago <coughs> uh, said, dear compatriots, Please do not come back because we need your money and we do not have jobs to offer to you. I'm quoting this because this is one of the exceptional cases where politicians say what they think, because normally they say or the opposite or something quite, uh, quite uh, uh, different. But also, let's say, to emphasize uh, how uh, complex, uh, uh, if not ambiguous, uh, uh, let's say, the policies uh, concerning on my youth, highly qualified migration are. So governments from one side, they want the economic capitals of those young qualified migrants, which means skills, investments, innovation, etc. But they, most of those governments, do not want their democratic capital. And I come, let's say, to that in a second. The nationalists, which are the most vocal in their claim to preserve the body politics, the national body, are very reserved concerning those uh, young let's say, migrants' understanding of the same national body, which is much more liberal, much more multicultural, much more open, sensitive to minorities, et cetera, et cetera. So um, when we say, and it was uh, unanimously stated in the introduction in Marian, that uh, uh, okay, it is a lost so that it is uh, such a traumatic uh, experience, uh, let's say, the brain migration of the youth. I would have this, uh, let's say, uh, more probably positive understanding that for me, this voting by feet remains a major critique of corrupted governments, of inefficient governments, of state captured states, etc. 
of captured states, etc. So uh, we should not forget this incredible contribution to the development of the states in the right direction that okay when the young and the brightest leave it is the most the the most obvious the most visible the most painful critique but it is very legitimate critique so that's why there is this uh, uh, dilemma, uh, voice versus uh, uh, exit. Uh, so the young who are among the most uh, uh, critical, the most active, the most committed uh, uh, to transition to, to really, uh, to, to real democratization of their society, should they stay there and protest or should they leave and uh, by leaving, uh, uh, let's say, protesting. Concerning, okay, let's, uh, this is politics level, so, uh, um, uh, um, really policy level. Uh, uh, I uh, do agree. I, I had the pleasure and the honor to lead a project on uh, uh, labor migration policy in Western Balkans. And uh, so that uh, uh, our major finding uh, was that diaspora engagement policies uh, were the most uh, uh, innovative uh, ones, the major policy innovation concerning, uh, of course, migration policies in the Western Balkans, uh, uh, the last uh, one to the last uh, one to decades. So in this sense, it is uh, a very, uh, very positive because it is really a major innovation in terms of legislation, in, in terms of institutionalization, uh, in terms of this uh, overproduction of uh, uh, all kinds of uh, policy documents, strategies, uh, Marian mentioned, uh, uh, etc why uh, it remains uh, so that's so good on the paper and so um, okay so inefficient let's say uh, 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 yeah in uh, uh, practice uh, just uh, to the, the the topic is huge we could uh, come back let's say to the uh, in the debate but uh, to two arguments so first uh, when you enter the cuisine with what we did in my research uh, of the elaboration of those policies the major actors of elaborating these innovative policies were not so much the governments, national governments, but international actors, IOM or other organizations. So those very beautiful policy documents have been produced by wonderful experts, of course, voted, let's say, by the parliament, etc., etc. But okay, it was not... Uh, yeah, how to say, uh, 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 genuine, uh, 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 let's say, in, in innovation. And another major challenge uh, for a diaspora engagement uh, uh, is uh, that uh, part of the diaspora, and it is quite a big part, let's say they left the country, okay, for the reasons I explained, because they do not like, they like their country, they like their culture, they like their people, for national, etc., they do not like their government, uh, and so that they do not want so much to engage with the, uh, uh, with the, those governments. When they engage, they are much more active than the governments. And I uh, come here, let's say, to make it uh, to shorten it, uh, uh, my comments a little bit. Uh, uh, let's say to this uh, uh, possibility or impossibility to uh, of return, so which is element of uh, disengagement. I'll start with a very nice example. So, uh, Marian, this uh, uh, excellent, brilliant young uh, school and activist, uh, uh, he's also one of ERMA uh, alumni. Uh, so, that ERMA is the European Regional Master in Democracy and Human Rights. Um, and so, that um, in my interviews with returnees, I was so happy, let's say, to find that some of them uh, returned to. Uh, BH, where in Sarajevo and uh, Bologna, the, this uh, uh, MA is uh, um, uh, uh, hosted, uh, because they learned that they are such innovative international European funded uh, 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 programs, uni university programs. So that, uh, um, okay, so I, I'm taking this example for two reasons. First, again, let's say to, to promote the academic and activist probably origin of Marian. But second, second to emphasize, to emphasize that the major reason for return are much less those policies, but much more the agency of returnees. 
a few really i take a few elements uh, of this really possibility and impossibility of return some of the returnees uh, do not match do not match there is mismatch of their skills in the local in terms of national labor markets why because they are overqualified they are overqualified just one example from my interviews so a lady who is a, um, a, a music therapist she says everybody adores let's say or her, her expertise and she's invited here and there to projects etc but there is no institution to employ her she's a freelance because everybody enjoys her expertise but the the labor market do, does not offer let's say stable stable position another uh, uh, okay so quote from a, from an interview for this possibility let's say to return is a very short quotation i learned to live with rules with rules i can't come back to a country where there are not a lot of rules there are all type of connections uh, etc informal informality in, in economy etc etc but okay to finish uh, this uh, 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 let's say part uh, with a positive note uh, so that i uh, really like very much uh, this uh, uh, example this incredibly uh, high number of patents uh, uh, which are created uh, by by returnees so that those who decide to return uh, uh, okay they uh, they bring innovation they they bring new horizons etc etc and again just uh, okay to mention most of them do not return definitely so that uh, they remain or transnational or they they simply remain more mobile and so that if tomorrow there is another opportunity they 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 would leave it is really not return uh, uh, as uh, as a final uh, uh, as a new fi final uh, uh, destination and uh, uh, really the almost the last uh, uh, comment so this uh, consensus regional consensus for the extremely huge importance of, of regional migration for a post-conflict region. So if again, I simplify what I did during this uh, short comments uh, is that if conflicts, it is okay. So the sphere of politics and so that they are mainly created from above. So we see in a post-conflict era migration taking the major role which is a transition from below and so we see regional migration which is mainly regional mobility as a major asset for reconciliation and for reconstruction it is extremely it goes much let's say beyond let's say labor markets despite the fact that it does uh, correspond to small labor markets so that uh, which really need uh, let's say more mobile uh, uh, labor force etc but this is the whole portrait of uh, uh, of a region and i'm finishing uh, with uh, let's say what is the future what i call innovative futures in uh, Puro, uh, which are conceptualized again by a very large cluster of uh, uh, concepts, uh, digital diaspora, think nets, uh, virtual return, uh, 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 etc. So that uh, not uh, only because they refer to the more digital, uh, 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 more and more digital societies we are living in, but also because uh, uh, they really express this complexity of being here and there. So not definitive uh, return, uh, which would never happen or, or not uh, in uh, next uh, uh, decades, uh, but uh, um, really um, uh, innovative, creative uh, uh, ways of uh, engaging uh, uh, with the host uh, societies being at the top of a uh, general trend. Again, congratulations uh, to Marian and uh, also to the organizers of this interesting debate.
Thank you, Anna. This has been the most engaging set of uh, of comments, and I think you really broadened uh, broadened the perspective in ways that that are simply fantastic. So many thanks for this. Um, there are a couple of questions already, um, but I'm a bit hesitant to go into them uh, into them right away because I also have a few questions uh, that I uh, that I wanted to ask on my own and one is basically a very simple question uh, which has something to do with basically biographies right um, I mean if we are talking about um, uh, young people leaving countries and at some later stage in their life also returning uh, the two countries perhaps what is actually the best point in time where to where to make this still happen because I mean once uh, once young people find families for instance have children uh, and so on i mean uh, then the the embeddedness also in uh, in societies wherever they wherever they landed uh, becomes obviously much stronger so i guess there are certain uh, certain points in uh, in a life when a uh, let's say a return uh, uh, is is more likely uh, and that in and of itself then also comes with a couple of sort of conditions attached right i mean uh, because uh, then you would want to have conditions also for your children, uh, family services, and so on. So, uh, isn't there an, an incentive structure here that would need to be uh, would need to be designed also in such a way and perhaps invested before you can expect uh, people to come back uh, in order to make it make it possible to sort of use these uh, these these turning points in individual lives when uh, when a return to a home country is more likely than than at other points so i just wanted to sort of uh, put this out as a uh, as an almost personal question because i've seen some of this in my own life right these moves are are determined by uh, also private uh, sort of uh, points uh, i just wanted to put this out i mean it's obviously not not so much zooming in on some of the main messages of the paper but uh, it's uh, uh, it's a sort of personal point that i wanted to start with so i don't know maria and anna uh, uh, who may want to respond to that right away anna yeah. <clears throat> Okay, go ahead, Marianne. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, 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 um, of course, that there is no right answer because the uh, question of leaving and returning somewhere is a like, highly individual. So, if you see, for example, the factors of young people leaving, um, uh, these countries are quite diverse. So, if you see their background, the study, the question of being employed or unemployed, your social background, so it's really, really quite. Um, quite diverse, so there is no, uh, let's say, a certain age or a pattern, but what is, uh, let's say, a global uh, um, a global characteristic to, 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 to this migration is not uh, more the return migration, but it's also the circular migration. So as you talk about being really difficult uh, to, to move um, with the family to find the proper conditions to another country, now we are talking about differences maybe in the language, uh, from at some point in the culture and some point, the knowledgeable migrants today prefer uh, to be more um, circular. So the return migration, as I mentioned in the in the paper as well, is more wanted, but is not necessary. And it's not necessary, especially today, because you have a lot of the ways of engaging and uh, helping and contributing, earning money, building careers, which can be remotely, which can be temporary, which can be uh, which can be seasonally. So most realistic or more realistic scenario is to have this circulation policies and uh, especially these um, uh, new policies from the European level, they promote this circular movement. They do not say that, okay, we need to go, the, the young people from Western Balkan seats now, they can return home. We here have created conditions, we have created a pipeline. No, because they prefer this uh, circulation of, 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 uh, of capital, circulation of knowledge, and the circulation of skills as the most wanted combination for the European Union, but also for uh, the Western uh, Balkan um, countries itself. Uh, so there are, as Professor Anna Krasteva mentioned, there is two sides from the story. One side is the activist, let's say civil society sectors supported by the international community. And on the other side, there is the politics side. So the civil society sector in this case led the debate from the early 2000s. So from the 2000 until 2005 and six, 
they were researchers, there were initiatives, they were flagging the problem, uh, problem, and together with the international community, they have created a lot of beautiful examples about what you have talked about, and those are the programs for reintegration of returnees. Because basically, when you uh, want to go back to your country, maybe you are the culture of the language, but not your family, not the other members. Uh, maybe, you know, you now you have uh, mixed marriage, people don't belong to the country, not at all by any other circumstances. So from this activistic and civil society point of view, there were beautiful programs about uh, learning the language, providing social security, uh, providing benefits, providing orientation scenarios, uh, you know, helping facilitating the paperwork, the administration, language, language classes. And this happened with the support of IOM and with the GIZ for the German Cooperation of International Cooperation Office. But as I mentioned, at some point, the funding ended and the capacity of uh, and the capacity of this project just collapsed because the government didn't want to accept to continue with that. So uh, imagine that you have in a certain uh, town a migration center point which just helps you a lot. You have it for three, four years, where you basically you having everything that you asked in the question, and in two, three years, because lack of interest or lack of funding, this initiative stops. So uh, uh, Professor Kastava rightly mentioned that not always the politics and the policy side it what this matter, uh, because the good practices can be seen from the civil society sector as well. And this, we have to find some sort of compromise between what you want to achieve when people return and uh, how we see them return and how we want the people to circulate. Uh, well, also the global characteristic is the of knowledgeable migrants is not only moving, it's about having the proper uh, position, the proper spot, the proper role to play in the society and to be part of the change. So if, and there is a young scientist, young entrepreneur living somewhere outside of the region. It will need much more than financial incentives to do that because in the paper I'm, right, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning about creating a common vision of the region. So we are here today, we're going to be 10 years uh, uh, from now there. Do we want to join us on this? And Serbia, uh, it's, a, it's a good example on this because um, they established one um, uh, uh, one initiative, it's called the Returning Point Tačka Povratka in, in Serbian, which basically facilitates all of the movements, facilitates everything that uh, uh, we are talking about right now. And they map the potential investment fields and the potential skills of their diaspora. So when they're inviting someone to, uh, for example, invest in Serbia, circulate in Serbia, they have a proper portfolio for them. And this is the invitation that the young people are, are, are waiting and then the young people are willing to accept. And when we are talking about later on stages in life, that's why you focus on the young people because the young, the youth brain drain, it's not, it, it's it's uh, different from the brain drain because the youth are a different category in the society. Nowadays, they're more mobile, they're more open, they're more tech savvy. So it's, they're more experimental, they're more adventurous. So basically you have a lot of more options, policy options, life options, experience options that uh, the governments and the civil society can try with them. So this is why I had the, the, the discussion towards that point. Thanks yeah. a lot, Marianne. Yeah. Anna, you want to chime in? Yes, uh, uh, I will I'll try very briefly to address your fundamental question of temporalities of return. Uh, so that uh, they are plural, and I mentioned uh, three of them very, very uh, uh, briefly. So wife, age, uh, a major uh, factor, family, uh, and the crisis, different crises. So wife age, of course, let's say the more mobile, the more open, let's say for return, the more open to live again, et cetera, et cetera, the more mobile are, of course, the youngest ones, uh, unmarried, et cetera. Family, family concerning temporality of return, uh, a family with children, uh, um, a, a place in two opposite directions. So one uh, is that because the children are integrated in the education system, even when the parents, for different reasons, could remain unemployed, et cetera, et cetera, in the host country, very often they um, prefer to stay there, uh, okay, for this, uh, for this reason. Uh, but it plays also in the opposite direction that there are families who return if they want their children 
let's say, to follow the national education, to follow an education in, let's say, the mother tongue. Uh, so that one factor, diff uh, completely a different family strategy, but uh, strategies, but this is a major factor. And the crisis, all types of crisis, uh, uh, so that uh, much more economic crisis, financial crisis, et cetera, are a major, major uh, factor, uh, uh, how to say, uh, governing temporality, because something which was not planned a return could become a project uh, 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 because of a crisis. But the more extreme external, uh, 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 the, uh, this factor is, uh, let's say, the, the, the least the impact. So that several of those who returned because of the economic financial crisis uh, 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 of a decade ago, uh, the moment they could find, uh, let's say, a new opportunity, they left uh, so that they do not, uh, okay, because it was not a personal, let's say, project, but uh, it, it, uh, uh, it happened to be. So very briefly, these are the three factors which impact the temporality of return. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's go into some of the questions. There are three from Ferdita Pustina. Um, I think on one of them, uh, uh, Marianne in particular, uh, touched basically, uh, which is the question of whether or not people shouldn't be moving freely. Right. This is the the idea of uh, uh, of the European Union, one of its fundamental freedoms, one that will eventually be uh, uh, expanded to the uh, to the Western Balkans, of course. Uh, so uh, I think that speaks to the point of circular migration. But uh, but Marianne may want to uh, uh, go into this question uh, again. The second one's more technical uh, about the uh, about the data uh, because Marianne, you also mentioned that. Uh, some of the uh, some of the data bases that that are being used by individual governments in the Western Balkans are rather shaky or outdated. So there's a question here whether uh, there was difficulty for you to to obtain data. And the last one I think is interesting because uh, uh, basically asked the question whether uh, the departure of so many young people doesn't actually also open opportunities on the on the labor market in societies for people who are slightly older who are 40 plus uh, uh, whether or not there are also also openings that uh, uh, that may be produced by by the departure of uh, of younger cohorts uh, Marianne, over to you on these questions yes okay about uh, the, the the first question about the data uh, the data on migration in general, not only in the Western Balkans, but also more developed countries, is really scarce because it's really hard to follow and to synchronize. For example, um, you know, when we talk about this communication between the Western Balkans and uh, the EU member states, there is, uh, there, there is a lack of it because there is no mirror data in the states. And also we are not considering uh, the uh, maybe the illegal migration and other sorts of migration that exist. Uh, 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 in fact, but they're not existing in paper. Uh, so uh, what I relied on my on my paper was more about uh, international data, data from a big uh, big uh, cohorts of time, for example, in the last 10, 20 years, because the censuses of uh, the Western Balkan six are old more than 10 years because of the COVID-19, they didn't happen and they should have uh, in the past two years, only North Macedonia had a census during the pandemics, and it turned out that 30% of the young people left in the last 20 years. Macedonia didn't, North Macedonia didn't have a census for the last 20 years due to some uh, political misunderstandings uh, uh, um, in the country. So the data that the censuses provide, it's not really um, uh, useful when you analyzing brain drain because there is no question about which are the factors do you want to leave, why did you leave, which are your qualification, uh, you know, what is your destination country, and there is no question about, um, there is no sexually a follow-up uh, on the next census because now in the census in, Macedonia, in North Macedonia, there are really short uh, comments of the questions of, um, you know, how everything is done, about uh, having a lot of objections about the regularity, and so on and so forth. So. In a nutshell, the statistics officially provided from the countries, they can, I cannot consider and they are not considered as reliable. Just one example, uh, in North Macedonia, in 12 years, from 2005 to 2017, the state statistical office managed to register only 12,000 people living. 
because if you want to be officially part of a statistic, then you have to um, uh, you have to uh, reassign from one place and assign to another. You have to say, I'm not living in this country anymore. I go to the police, I go to the other institutions because I don't want to be part of the statistics. Many of the people do not do that. So basically, uh, uh, the international data and the projections of really big international organization is the focus on this paper, and I think they are more reliable than uh, uh, comparing to the statistic from the national censuses or any other research. And the other problem about data is not having quality research, as I mentioned, because uh, we have big countries, a complex topic, so nobody is doing a research on this topic, not youth studies anymore. In the uh, in the paper, I'm using the Friedrich Heber Stiftung ones because it was most comprehensive about the whole region. If you go uh, in uh, in the researches from the other countries, then you will see that uh, all of the data is produced by the civil society organizations, which of course have a limited scope. They only uh, research one uh, one portion of the population. They only focus on one thing because their uh, capacities, of course, and their role in this pro problem cannot uh, suffice all the data uh, that is needed. And the data is the first thing when you want to create some uh, comprehensive policies. Uh, but the second question of a larger perspective about the movement, um, uh, in, in the paper and my standpoint, it's all about the movement. And that's why I'm saying that this rhetoric of we want to keep youth home, it's outdated. I mean, today, it's really counterproductive to try to keep young people home. And with everything happening around with three decades of transition and slow economic pro 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 problems, it's expected to young people to leave the region for education, family reunification, uh, for a better life. Uh, the migration or the free movement should be now uh, uh, in accountability of both sides, one of the European Union and the Western Balkan Six, as I mentioned, to find a way to circulate or find a way to return. This is not uh, impediment towards the free movement, it just creating conditions about channelized migration. As I mentioned, creating offers, creating a vision of the region, um, creating a fertile grounds for investment, uh, creating grounds for mobility exchange, not only between EU and the Western Balkans, but, but between uh, the Western Balkan six and south. And uh, what is supported by this circular migration and the free movement of, of people is that uh, the, the Balkan barometer, which is uh, a research done by Regional Cooperation Council says that 77% of the Western Balkan population support this type of initiatives and support circular migration within the region, which is basically uh, the point of having a regional approach towards rangering, but it's the point of the new policies of regionality. Um, I, I personally myself don't think uh, that uh, the European access, the, the accession process will advance in the further years. And I believe that all these policies which are uh, emphasized on the region should provide this free movement of people in the region and between the regions. And about the third question of, um, the, I think it was about uh, opportunity for, let's say a bit uh, older generation of young generation uh, living. I don't, I don't see that as an opportunity of young people leaving. I always see it as, uh, you know, as uh, something missed. Uh, and it depends, of course, of the employers and the job offers about putting the, uh, the age number or age limit in some of the, uh, of the job positions. I believe that this, this is not, uh, let's say, a question that it can have like a general answer, but it's more uh, from an employer uh, to an employer of uh, of practice from practice to, to the region. In my opinion is that young people living is not opening space for, space for uh, other groups. On the long run, will create only uh, a, a bigger problems and will make the, uh, the region less attractive to live in. 
Thanks a lot, Mayan. Since you mentioned the uh, sort of politics of regionality uh, to the to the previous question, there is a question from Katarina Spasovska from the IOM in North Macedonia. I guess you know each other um, uh, on the on the possible implications of a mini Schengen zone in the Western Balkans or uh, open Balkans. Um, is this uh, uh, something, uh, Anna, that uh, that you have thoughts about? It's an open question. Um, but perhaps you, you can dwell on that, Anna? Yes. Um, I think uh, this is a new wave of uh, uh, regional policies, uh, uh, and they are defined in the same spirit, both at European level and at a regional level. And this, uh, this is a very uh, positive uh, 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 perspective. So at European level, also Marian mentions uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uh, uh, proposed a few years ago this uh, uh, agenda for soft connectivity uh, where migration is one of the bridges. So to start uh, uh, really bridging a different uh, the different uh, 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 states through migration and mobility uh, as well as uh, through uh, of course uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, um, uh, through digital uh, connections etc uh, etc et and uh, uh, let's say mini schengen is a regional initiative in the same uh, spirit of opening up uh, uh, the space of encouraging uh, citizens, uh, uh, let's say, to benefit uh, from that uh, of helping, uh, uh, helping the the uh, uh, the labor markets. We have to understand that uh, the labor markets uh, uh, suffer a lot because these are uh, relatively small uh, uh, labor markets, uh, so that uh, not very easy to attract the migration from far uh, immigration from uh, uh, far, far, far away and a more mobile regional labor force would really uh, uh, help uh, very much. Having said that, uh, I do not want to make a, a very idealistic uh, picture of the, <laughs> of the regional cooperation because there is still a lot of competition on that. Uh, so that uh, countries uh, um, uh, which already have uh, uh, um, the, the, the reputation, uh, but uh, uh, also the experience of attracting labor migrants uh, or labor mobile workers from the region, they compete uh, uh, among themselves. For instance, uh, Montenegro is a new player uh, uh, in this uh, uh, sense, so attracting uh, really successfully uh, uh, mobile la labor workers from uh, the neighboring Western Balkan states, but it is in a huge competition with Croatia, which attracts in a much more successful, successful way. So that the regional uh, champions, <laughs> I would say, champions uh, of attracting uh, regional labor force, they compete among each other. So that uh, there are no, how to say, uh, perfect uh, schemes uh, which uh, would uh, appease all tensions, uh, uh, etc. But I, uh, um, and I'm causing here, I would not say that this competition is destructive. It is um, normal let's say for market uh, relations and the, so the countries which offer the best, uh, the, the, uh, really the best opportunities, okay, uh, attract also, uh, let's say the, 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 the best uh, uh, labor force. And just one thing, I'm really sorry, I always want to call them, but so it's something else. For me, uh, let's say uh, a major trend uh, um, happened the last, uh, the last decade which is that the Western Balkans became a major destination for Western Balkan migrations, which was, which has never been the case before. So that if before, let's say long uh, term uh, migrations, US, but also for Germany, etc., were the main game in town, today more and more, let's say migration is short term. A short distance migration. So going BH uh, citizens going to Slovenia, almost everybody going going to uh, uh, Montenegro. Uh, okay, so some Macedonian Serbian going to uh, 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 no, almost everybody going to Croatia, uh, Serbian uh, Serbs and uh, Macedonians going to to to, to Montenegro, etc. So for me, it is a major positive uh, uh, positive trend. 
Can you give us a sense of the sort of proportions of that? Are there any numbers to this? Because uh, this sort of intra-regional uh, migration, to, to some extent, even commuter distances probably, uh, would be interesting if you if you describe this as a new trend, um, whether there are sort of some figures to that, perhaps. Uh, uh, yes, uh, of, co of course, there are, uh, there are figures. I am unable now <laughs> to produce all of them, but for instance, if you um, uh, compare, let's say, the major uh, uh, immigration countries for BH citizens 20 or 30 years ago and today, you will see a very considerable change, a very considerable. So if before it, uh, there were definitely, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Western countries, now, okay, they are, uh, uh, the first one, I think, is Slovenia. And if you look at another type, types of statistics. So the structure of uh, migrants in the host country, again, you will see more and more, let's say, citizens from the Western Balkans in the pa panorama of those, uh, 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 of those statistics. So both immigration statistics and immigration statistics, they both, let's say, illustrate what I am explaining now, but I'm absolutely unable to give you concrete. I could send you uh, our report. Uh, it is quoted uh, by Marian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I can't. Uh, I, I, I do not have the figures. But uh, really, uh, okay, both uh, uh, immigration and immigration statistics illustrate the same uh, growing, increasing importance of uh, regional, uh, regional mobility and uh, migration. And just a small element, I did not want to take the floor on no, no all questions, but co concerning statistics, which is a huge, huge, of course, uh, let's say, a question uh, that there are no good uh, policies without, uh, let's say, uh, uh, reliable uh, uh, data. Okay. Um, to say that they are not enough, okay, it has been already said. A few, uh, uh, let's say, more elements uh, to the answer of this question. Uh, first uh, is that uh, harmonizing uh, the Western Balkans uh, uh, statistical tools with the EU one uh, uh, is one of the requirements for the uh, EU uh, integration. So that, uh, um, yeah, uh, this is a major trend uh, so that they... Uh, are already uh, uh, using and should even more uh, 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 use, uh, 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 let's say, the methodology of uh, 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 Eurostat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And at the same time, uh, there is a very strong, I would say, not movement, but uh, almost uh, uh, among uh, um, academics in the region uh, to create uh, uh, an observatory uh, uh, for, for migration with the major. Uh, aim uh, really to harmonize the statistic, to make analysis, what Marian mentioned, that uh, figures are not enough. Uh, okay, they should be really analyzed uh, by experts in the field, uh, 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 etc. So that uh, one uh, BH uh, scholar uh, um, um, is uh, the leader, uh, let's say, of this uh, of these proposals, uh, and so that uh, both uh, um, examples I gave are ve very very positive. So that um, migration statistics are never enough in any country in the world because it is a very mobile phenomenon, uh, 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 etc. Um, but uh, 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 let's say there are uh, positive developments in this uh, regard. Thank you. Maya, you wanted to come in on this point? Yes, if we have if we have time, I think we have a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on uh, Katerina's question, I believe, about the, the Open Balkan Initiative. Uh, I'm one of those who think that Open Balkan Initiative is a bit dangerous because um, in a way it jumps a lot of things that are done until now. Because if we see this um, the regional cooperation that I'm emphasizing in the paper started for the regional economic area, continued with the common regional market, and now we have this third initiative, which is the Open open Balkan. It's more political one, let's say, than more essential one for the topic of youth brain drain, but also for the other topics that it covers. Another thing is that it's a partial. So on the Open Balkan, not all of the Western Balkans country uh, joined. It's only North Macedonia, Albania, and Serbia. And the other countries are objecting to, to join other because of some bilateral dispute or other claiming that the Serbia is the big player in this initiative taking 
uh, a lot and giving too little. And of course, here we talk about uh, foreign direct investments and in, in the in the in the trade in the region. So for me, this is a duplication from the efforts and maybe can create some backsliding of everything that was done in this economic area. And a lot of things were done, for example, with the tariffs, uh, with the roaming, uh, part started digitalization, holding this Western Balkan digital uh, digital summits. And now I think uh, Open Balkan is competition to, to, to the other two initiatives and cannot, uh, let's say, be oriented to the same aims as, 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 sh as should. And the third thing is that the regional economic area and the common regional market are fully supported by the European Union policies and the Open Balkan is more a declar declarative uh, political movement, which, by, which uh, on the other hand, uh, was announced prior to the elections in North Macedonia, prior to the elections in Serbia, or in the same period, and when the Albanian government had a few pro protests of the opposition for taking them of power. So for me, it's a creation that something needed to, 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 to be proven as a progress, as a movement, but essentially I would, I would, I would uh, uh, rely on the youth brain drain and regional cooperation on the things that are already there and uh, redevelop and reprogram common regional market. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, as we're coming uh, to the end of our session, I wanted to sort of bring in one aspect uh, with, a, with a question um, that I think we haven't really touched upon uh, uh, sort of sufficiently yet. Uh, Anna mentioned it, but I think it was worth, worth dwelling uh, on a little bit. And that's the relationship between all of this and, and democratic developments. Um, because I think there is a dilemma here, uh, which is that on the one hand, uh, we're talking about a massive migration of uh, young, especially also urban and educated people. That is a group that has particular agency also in relation to uh, uh, democratic developments in this country. Now, if you remove an entire cohort uh, or sort of um, collective agent, as it were, uh, uh, of that, then obviously you deepen some of the non-democratic dilemmas in uh, in countries. Uh, it's exactly what, uh, what Anna mentioned earlier on. Question here is, how do you break that? I mean, how do you sort of break that that almost vicious circle um, uh, that that emerges from this uh, from this youth departure from the region uh, for the also longer term democratic developments because it entrenches basically a lot of the uh, the non democratic uh, sort of uh, phenomena. Put it this way. Um, I wanted to put this question to both of you uh, uh, in conclusion also of this uh, of the session. Who would like to go first? Maya and Anna. Anna. <laughs> because I have also to leave in a few minutes, so, but I hope uh, I could say uh, till the end. Uh, if I summarize, uh, let's say, state versus diaspora, let's say for centuries probably, the main link was through language, of course, culture, traditions, etc., etc. The last years, it is completely re constructed and a major link is through activism. So in the traditional, I simplify again for this debate, in the traditional relation state diaspora. So diaspora was positively linked and supportive of the states in the new activist, let's say type of relationship so diaspora is very, especially young, educated, etc. not all diaspora. It is critical to the state. So that if I really, let's say, come to your question. From one side, this democratic capital has left the country is explicitly for political reasons that they do not want to be part of really states which are corrupted and efficient. Etc. Et From another side, being, being active, really taking part in demonstrations when they are back in uh, uh, the country, uh, 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 exercising pressure through their diaspora organizations, etc., voting, etc. These are mechanisms, let's say, for democratic uh, enhancement in their host countries, being 
okay, or returnees or being, um, being, uh, being migrants. But this is a major, really, a, a, a major a new trend. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, with, has to be understood because if we want to understand, let's say, policies for diaspora engagement, why they do not function, it is because, okay, several diaspora members do not want to support the policies of their states. They want to reform completely their states. And it is a very ambiguous, uh, uh, again, relation so that there are no simple answers because they will not leave their democratic and meritocratic wives abroad for coming and fighting, let's say, in the country. But um, some of them, and not all of them, but some of them really do contribute uh, through activism, uh, through voting, uh, through bringing uh, uh, innovations uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, liberal democratic uh, a more open uh, uh, spirit and also changing the whole pattern of migration. That migration today is much less for job. It is, uh, 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 let's say, for uh, uh, for digni a dignified life in a democratic uh, in a democratic country, contributing as much as possible to the democratization of uh, the origin country. Excellent. Thanks, Marian. Your thoughts on this. Uh, yes, so it's a really it's a really complex question about democratic prosperity and the diaspora, and of course, as Professor Krastava mentioned, there are a bit oppositions of democratic movements from the diaspora to uh, come back to the country to have uh, a relationship with the country, but. Uh, I see that democratic development or democratic progress with the diaspora is not done through the democratic institutions. For me, it will be done and should be done more through the economic ties. So, for example, uh, that's why I'm more insisting on an economic perspective of the region. Let's say if we talk about the connection with the diaspora, then about the democratic, because on one hand, as you can offer them uh, really a good space for investment, if you can offer them fiscal benefits, if you can offer them, um, if you can offer them promotion to come back to the country, uh, with that, for me, um, uh, goes a certain uh, a certain amount of democratic standards and principles that you need to respect. But this, let's say, bluntly connection between um, uh, diaspora bringing more democracy and more democratic. Uh, progress to the country for me i don't uh, i don't think that this is an option right now it's not wanted especially because some of the parliaments uh, for example in north macedonia we have three seats for the diaspora members which were scrapped because they started to make to have differences between how the diaspora see on the country and the development of the country and how the local government uh, see the, the 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 development of uh, of the of, of these countries so basically through the economic ties, I believe that is the starting point and through this economic pipeline should bring also a democratic progress to this country. Thanks a lot, Marianne. As you saw, it's Anna already had to uh, had to leave, unfortunately. I guess before we leave, uh, before we lose even Marianne uh, or many of you, I guess we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here. First of all, thank you all for for joining us and for posing the many questions that you did, even if we did not manage to address all of them. Second, uh, in absentia by now, uh, many thanks to Anna for her wonderful comments uh, throughout this conversation. And most importantly, obviously, many thanks to Marianne. Congratulations again on this study. Um, I really encourage all of you to have a closer look at it. Uh, the link's been posted in the chat and uh, it obviously is also published on the GMF website, as are many other uh, papers that's, that have been produced over the years in this Rethink CE uh, fellowship series, including one that actually looks at the role of uh, diasporas for democratic developments in their, uh, in their country of origins. So many thanks, Mayan, for, uh, for doing this research with us and for us all. Uh, we'll certainly try to uh, sort of make this as public as possible and we hope uh, that it feeds many more discussions uh, of this kind. Uh, everybody else, please do stay uh, tuned. We will have more sessions like this on a whole range of topics from Central and Eastern Europe coming up in the uh, coming weeks and, uh, and months. But at this stage, thank you all again. Be well and till soon, I hope. Goodbye.